the days that I don't want to train and, and do like my training protocols from running martial arts, like working out, like none of that stuff, it, like the days that I show up to the gym, quote unquote, are the best days like that I don't want to go. So if I don't want to go and I just show up and I just start, there's, there's a notch in your mindset that's it's activated and it's toughened. And so just get started and it's basic and it's, it's simple, but it's not easy because the mind starts making up all these excuses. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, this is Agostino. Making the shift from W-2 employee to entrepreneur can be very, very daunting. I know that when I finally committed to the journey, I had some financial pitfalls and had to learn some very important concepts to take control of my finances and my life. But it was through that adversity that can help establish you as an entrepreneur that you want to become. Well, today's guest understands this as he had to overcome many challenges before founding his own company, 46 and 2 Wealth Partners, which is a fee-only registered investment advisory firm. Now, because of his struggles, the business is rooted in helping people explore the wisdom of true wealth. He gets his message out as the host of the Jesse T Show, and it's a mindset-focused podcast that teaches anyone hunting greatness in business, wealth, and wellness in relationships and the secrets to success. Now, with all that, I'd like to welcome Jesse Todesco to the show. Hey, Jesse, thanks for coming on. Agostino, brother, my pleasure. Thank you to you and the listeners for having me, man. I'm excited. No, me too, man. I've been, been uh, holding out for this for a while, so I'm very excited to have you on. Now, if you like what Jesse has to say, you can reach him via this contact page at 46and2wealthpartners.com. And if you like our content, please don't forget to leave a comment, rate the show, give us a thumbs up. Always love that. Now, if you uh, text the word FREEDOM to 202-410-4202, you get our free ebook, The Bulletproof Guide to Raising Capital. Okay, Jesse, go ahead and tell the listeners a little bit about how you got your start, how you got really rolling in, uh, in what you're doing today. You know, I think the narrative of this conversation is going to be overcoming adversity to being able to serve others uh, and show up well in the world. And so just, you know, for some context, man, I had a rough upbringing in Boston, uh, went through some adversity, uh, was an entrepreneur at heart, was, was doing some interesting things as a kid, buying, selling, trading comic books, baseball cards, kind of had this natural hustle because I came from nothing. Um, and it led me through some seasons of life. But, you know, it just through the years, I realized I had a scarcity mindset and it was because we had no money growing up. And so once I learned about abundance and, and things like gratitude and self-awareness, I really started learning more about um, wealth and what that meant and how some of the richest families in, in the country and in the world became that way. And, you know, to, to what you do for a career, most wealth is transferred through real estate. And so learning about those different things and understanding how money worked just set me on a path to learn about it myself. And basically for the last nine years, um, I've grown through different iterations of entrepreneurship and becoming a wealth manager. Excellent. Excellent. You know, it's funny because I had a very similar upbringing in Canada where as a young kid, I, I wanted to have my own deal too. I wanted to do, I wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was a kid. And all those ideas were basically squelched <laughs> by my parents. Um, because at the time, if you're, and we, we, you know, I grew up to immigrants. So for, for the immigrant to be an entrepreneur was a very, very different thing, at least for, for my parents anyway, uh, very outside the norm for them. So that's why they wanted me to be safe. You know, they don't want me to, to risk anything. And even to this very day, they're still, they're still worried about me risking things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I think, I, which I I think is kind of funny. <laughs> in, in a similar, uh, you know, I'm, I'm third generation Italian. I know you're of Italian her heritage too. And they were all about work ethic and making something of the promise of America. And so they were extremely risk adverse. They were trading time for money. They were squirreling their nuts away. They didn't understand investing. Some of us got lucky uh, where our grandparents, you know, got into real estate again and just kind of were able to pass down real estate through the generations, which was great. But at the end of the day, you know, I didn't have any shining examples on how to run a business. So a lot of it was dumb luck. A lot of it was trial and error. There was a lot of failing forward, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Uh, but there was always this interest in people and in, in running my own thing where I didn't have to really answer anyone else unless I chose to. Right, right, right. Well, and tell us a little bit more about that because I know that you had some some uh, some rough patches, right? I oh, yeah. read about that, and I mean, you just talked about it a second ago. You alluded to it. Tell tell us one of these one of these moments that really really ended up what was seemingly was a really bad time, but it really gave you a big push forward. Yeah. So so growing up, um, you know, I was I was a good kid, focused on school. Although grades weren't important as much as sports and girls were, but I was definitely into that and. You know, uh, I grew up in a really rough town of Boston where it was a fighting town, always getting into fights. Uh, and there was a lot of drugs being sold and consumed in my, my area. 
And so my dad was a 35 year heroin addict before he kicked it for the last 10 years of his life, which was beautiful to see. But during some time of my up like gr growth period between probably I'd say 19 and 21, I, I actually dealt drugs and did drugs. And so that entrepreneurial hustle was being used for evil, I would so to speak, like, like kind of call it. And so but the weird thing about it was I was hiring people to, to help me do this. And so I, there was this entrepreneur skill that I was using, but I realized I was using it for, for bad. And so I took a step back, realized that wasn't the life that I wanted to live. Um, I had some family in the military. My mom, first and foremost, served in Vietnam War, full active duty, badass woman. My grandfather, World War II veteran. And just having that military influence always guided me up until that point, even when I went wayward for a couple of years. And then I got back on track and decided to go serve the country. And so uh, en enlisted in the, the Navy and got myself away from that environment and got myself out of Boston and, and realized how small my perspective was for a city kid that thought he knew everything. I knew nothing. And so I needed to really get out and expand and meet people and see the world for what it was. And it gave me enough space to really clear my head and basically make the decision that I had some gifts and some tools to offer the world. Let's go ahead and, and, and use those the right way. And that set me down the path of entrepreneurship and four different startups. Uh, two of them were successful. Two of them were flops. Um, and, and the most recent one's really successful with 46 and two wealth partners. So it was, I had to learn the hard way because I guess it's maybe being a Capricorn. You have to, for me, I have to learn uh, on my own. Someone can't tell me how to do it. I have to go do it myself. And so that's what I did. I, have, I've, I've had the bumps to get to the glory. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, man, what, what a story, man, because that's um, it's, it's one of those things that it, it went through a lot of pain and suffering to overcome it to now to get to where you are today. It's uh, it's amazing. I mean, I've had similar sort of journey where I get totally wiped out, lose everything and had to reboot my entire life right from scratch. Right. It's like sold everything all about my car and some and <laughs> kept that and, and reboot the whole life. Not everyone has to do that. I don't think it's a prerequisite for many people, right? It's it's not. But do you think life would have been very different had had you attacked uh, your your life as a kid early on? Do you really yeah. see that happening? Yeah. So I I do reminisce. I I, I my one of my life goals uh, we talked about before jumping on air the value of time and and a, there's a Stoic philosophy I believe in called memento mori and it means know that you're mortal, know that you must die, but let that be the motivation to live life well. And so because I've had some of these instances where I've literally held death in my hands twice in my life, I understand the value of time. Um, I don't, the whole goal for me, and I've learned this because I've had, you know, my parents were married after they had me, like they were married before me, they came together to have me. And so I had older relatives and like one of the biggest narratives I got from them was dying without regret. And so I don't have any regrets looking back. I do sometimes think about, you know, if I decided to make this decision, what would it lead to? But I'll tell you, I am very much happy and satisfied with the bumpy road because it was able to give me the life that I have today. So I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what, though? One thing that uh, I'm sure you get them on your show, I get them on my show all the time and you, and you hear about it as well. The guys that, that went through super hard, rough patches and life was terrible and awful and, <laughs> you know, all kinds of bad stuff. And then all of a sudden something happens and now... Now everything is doing great. I mean, it's not a prerequisite for the people listening right now. It's, you don't have to have that same sort of thing. I think what, for many folks that want to make a big change in their life, it doesn't, it doesn't require that you have to lose everything or go through, go through some really bad times with drugs or whatever. I think what matters more is realizing that we're running out of time and use that as the big push yes. to, to make that shift in your life. And I mean, when it's funny you should mention stoicism because when I realized stoicism and what it was about and, and really got to studying the, the human condition, that served as a real big change for me to really get out of doing corporate and quitting corporate and, and never to go back. I'll never go back to corporate ever again. I can't, yeah, cool. I, you know, but, but it took years to figure it out, you know, and, and wasted a lot of time doing it. That's, that's the unfortunate part, you know. Yeah, it's it's like the the Matrix that that scene where Morpheus is holding the pills and he's like, okay, this is the corporate life and this is what you're used to and this is comfortable and you'll you won't be awakened and you'll you'll know none the wiser and then here's like the hard path and this is this is gonna be hard to swallow literally and figuratively and like you're gonna learn about the world and you know but you've set yourself free and 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 you've been able to leave the nine to five behind and whether you're working nine to five less or more as a business owner you know a lot of times business owners end up working more but at least you're doing it for your own dream and you're doing it the way that you want to do it on your terms. 
And I think the biggest thing that you pointed out is that you don't have to walk through the fire to become this warrior, to become this person who, uh, you know, has a chip on their shoulder and, you know, wants to, you know, prove everyone wrong. But life is interesting. Sometimes the bumps that you do have in the battle wounds are what keep us colorful and what keep us, you know, motivated. So yes, you can have a straightforward life, but I find the most interesting people that I connect with a lot of times do have those battle wounds, so to speak. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think, and I think part of it is, is that you, you really have to make that decision and visualize your life the way you want to live it on your own terms. And for many people, that's, that's the hard part. You know, that's the hard part. They're unable to see beyond what, what they're currently living. Let's say it is a 40 hour work week and a 40 hour job that they despise. And not all 40 hour jobs are like that, you know, and often on this show, I rail on it probably more than I should probably because I, I did not have a good time doing that. But uh, for, I, I know that for many people out there, they, they do want to have freedom. But I think just to your point a second ago, the comfort, you know, the comfort level, it's knowing that in two weeks from now, that big check's going to be coming in and I don't have to worry about it for another two weeks. Right. It's, it's sedation, man, unfortunately. I mean, again, there's amazing companies, there's amazing managers, which I can, I call them leaders because managers are just people that kind of tell you what to do. Leaders lead from the front. So there's companies that are great. And I, and I, I would talk to someone who's still in a nine to five. And as long as the company has a great culture and you believe in that company, you believe in the mission and you feel like you have ownership in that company, high five, like keep doing that thing. But as soon as you feel taken advantage of, as soon as you feel like you're being led down a path that doesn't serve you or align with your mission or your ethos or whatever it is that you want to create, you know, this is a beautiful time. Like chaos is a beautiful time to create. And there's a lot of chaos going on right now in the world. And, you know, I'll tell you from my perspective as a wealth manager, you know, I don't like ever kicking someone when they're down. I know there's a lot of people that have lost businesses, lost jobs, but this has been a really good time for my business because most people have money questions right now. They need to know how to have more cash flow. They need to know how to, you know, scale their business or, or do certain investments, whatever those might be, real estate, stock market, whatever it is. And, and for me, it's been beautiful because I'm able to come in and, and help people during this time. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so for those folks, let's say right now there is an entrepreneur that's currently working a 40 hour job, right? They want to make that shift to become a full-time entrepreneur and maybe they have a little bit of money saved up. Maybe they don't. Right. But they reach out to you, right? What, what would you, what would you do? What would be your, your advice to them? What would you do for them? Maybe even as a business, what would you, what would you, how, how do you see that working out for them? There's three quick points. I literally had this conversation this morning with a gal named Darcy that I knew from years ago in the sales company I used to be, be in. And she asked me the same question. She was getting into this industry uh, as a consultant, as a business owner that she had been in for 11 years. She has great sales background, great sales acumen, great experience in this business. But for one reason or another, she was let go after five years with this company because there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee when you work for somebody else. And so now she's like, well, I want to work on my own and go do my own thing. So what do you recommend? How would I do this? And the three things that I would tell anyone in that position, number one, find someone who's doing exactly what you're doing 20 years down the road. And so for me, I found a guy named Patrick Tucker. He's an investment manager. He's a fiduciary. He operates his business the same way I operate my business. Um, he's a dad. I'm a dad. He's into health and wellness. Like there's a lot of crossover and, and, and uh, tribalism in a sense. So I would, I would, I would want to follow this guy across the street. Uh, so to speak. And he taught me more in the one year mentorship engagement that we had last year than I would have learned in five years on my own and maybe if ever. And so I would say, number one, if you're going to go independent, you have to surround yourself intentionally with people that are better, stronger, faster, that can help bring you up. Right. So that's number one. Number two, it's going to sound really cheesy and really Gary Vee of me, but practicality. You have to have cash flow. You have to have money to be able to bridge the gap. You have to be able to have runway. And so Always plan on three to five times more than what you think it's going to cost. It's always more than what you think it's going to cost. So if it's if it's 50 grand to get the business up and running, plan on at least 100 to 150 minimum. And it could be much more than that because things things happen. You try marketing ideas that may not work. You, you, you have to self-educate on the job training. That costs money. So you can't just look at the month-to-month P&L for the business or your personal life. You have to look at things that kind of you can't see yet and plan for the future that way. And so I would say practicality and having money is number two or some sort of funding. And then number three is once you commit, and this is again, cliche, you got to burn the boats. You can't give yourself a back door. You got to put your, your back against the wall. You got to say, this is it. I'm all in. I've planned for it well enough. I have the contacts. I have the structure, the systems, whatever it is that you need to do to build this business and just go all in. 
And that doesn't mean kill yourself trying to do it. Although if you're a workaholic and that makes you happy, go for it. It just means that don't give yourself a back door because you won't commit and you may not go for things as hard as you would have if there's a plan B, if that makes sense. So yeah. leave the plan B behind. There's only one plan. There's only one mission. And, and, and military comes out during these times when I think about this, but there's a no fail situation. You have to succeed at all costs. Now, getting back to that first point, th that mentorship, was that like a one year mentoring thing you said? Did you have to pay for that? Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I'm always been the, I'm a student at heart and, and I've become a student to the point where I can teach other people like what I've learned. But um, I've always wanted to surround myself with wise counsel and, and people that are smarter than me in different areas so that I can learn and grow and then give back. And, you know, Patrick found me actually through a Facebook ad. I'm sure I, I matched an avatar for what he was looking for. And he connected with me. And it was really interesting because it took him about a year. It took me about a year to come to my senses and hire him. Um, but during that year, I learned so much about client management and onboarding, if you will, and how to treat people. I felt like I was really good with people. But once I connected with him, I saw another level of like elegance in a sense of really, you know, not crapping on people if they don't decide now and, and not, not hurrying people up. And I used to come from a sales business where it was all about sense of urgency and uh, factors of impulse, like making people make a decision now. And so seeing that long-term play really attracted me because the way that I operate my business now, these people that I cut my client family that come into my business, I look at them as a, a lifelong relationship. And so that's what he did with me. So I think it attracted me, number one. And then number two, at the end of that year, I was like, you know what? This guy's given me above and beyond. I want to work with this guy. And so he played the long game. And then, yeah, I paid him for a year to be my consultant directly for a year where he coached me, he had my back and he gave me everything he had. I mean, that, that part is huge because in a way you also committed and you burned the boats with that one action. Yep. Right. It's, it's like you, you, you put your money where your mouth is. And it's, it's funny how so many people are afraid to do that. You know, they're afraid to, to spend and invest the money in themselves to get that far ahead. I mean, I, I bet you would say, I don't, know, like, I don't know, I don't know that you're mentor personally, but I, I mean, we, we mentor people. I mentor people. I'm sure you do as well. Yep. You're able to help people get that much further along. And it's like, it's certainly, it's certainly worth whatever money we charge. Right. I mean, I mean the, 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 um, the way I can make it make sense is when I help people with their investments in the market, um, Yes, the goal is to help grow those investments and raise those investments up and, and you know, help them essentially stop trading time for money as soon as possible. But more importantly, I help them from making mistakes that would set them back a lifetime. And that's what a consultant will do. That's what a mentor will do. Yes, they'll give you information so that you can grow, but they'll tell you about the stuff that you shouldn't do so you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, yeah. Now, why do you think people have such a resistance to either investing in themselves or quitting that, that nine to five, that even though they're totally unhappy, they're dragging their ass into, into a job they hate, working with a bunch of people that don't want to be there either. And why, why do you think that happens? It's, it's, two, it's two things for me. It's, it's what people have been trained to do ever since we were kids. We've been put into a classroom situation that was modeled for the World War II Industrial Revolution to be able to turn out factory workers. You go in at a certain time, you punch a card, you leave at a certain time, you have someone standing at the front of the, the assembly line telling you what to do. Like we created factory workers and that model's dead and old now. Now, now schools are being looked at as, as a sham or a scam for certain things. Like there's some of these universities that are out there that are putting kids $200,000, $300,000 in debt. It's just not working anymore. So I think the mindset, the whole conversation we can have today is pretty much around mindset, but the mindset of people that were ingrained on being worker bees. And so the, the second piece of that is comfort. They think it's comfortable to be able to work for somebody to get a check every two weeks. They think it's comfortable to get benefits because that's what they've been programmed to do. And once you realize that you could get fired, like my friend who's a freaking badass because someone just had a wild hair up their ass and didn't want to deal with her anymore after five years of service, there is no comfort. There is no guarantee. And at the same time, instead of building somebody else's business or dream, like go back to investing in yourself, which is one of the most important investments you'll ever make and build something for yourself. And so I think it's the mindset that just kind of shapes all of that and the, the knowledge that needs to be changed in the way that we do business, so to speak in life. And if people could really double down on their independence and getting comfortable being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I think the world would be a different place. Yeah. I mean, you know, the part of it is, is that, that, that whole manufacturing industrial age era of, of churning out people. I mean, it all, you're right. It all started with Henry Ford 
when he created in, in the rise of the unions, right? Eight hours of work, eight hours of, of time with your family, eight hours of sleep. It was all designated like that. And it's since then, that model has gone global. And everyone in the, on the whole planet, well, just about everyone in, in the westernized world anyway, follows that model. Yep. Previous to that, this is largely, uh, every, most people were entrepreneurs because if they didn't work, no one ate. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And we're seeing a resurgence of entrepreneurship again, which is beautiful. We're seeing this consciousness awakening, which, ha which is happening and people coming online and thinking for themselves and questioning authority. Because if you think about it, the powers that be want to stay in power, right? Not to get too political or government or, or, or big business. But um, even though I, I, I operate in that world, I'm a rebel at heart. So any chance I get a, to like buck the system effectively or teach people how to think for themselves and be free thinkers and you know, I've, I've helped people go from nine to five and start their own business. And I've helped people, you know, grow something that they wanted to build. And it was all about just changing their mindset and, and doubling down on themselves. Yeah. I think that's, that's the part that's scary though, for a lot of people, right. Is that they're afraid that if, if they, if they jump off that ledge or take that step off that ledge, there's nothing there to catch them. Yep. And sometimes, and sometimes there isn't, I mean, I, I'll tell you what, that 888 model was so ingrained in me, especially as a young kid of immigrants, oh, yeah. that it became part of my identity. And if I wasn't working for someone, then I was worthless. Yep. I was a piece of crap and I was worthless, right? And to the point where when I got fired from jobs, of which I got fired from plenty of them. Good for you. I, was, <laughs> I know, right? I'm really, really good at getting fired. Good uh, for you. It was... Um, it was one of those things that I felt like like a total like a total idiot of what did I do wrong. Many times it wasn't actually me that did anything wrong. It was just I ended up with, with a bad company, and there's yep. plenty of very bad companies out there, and that's my fault for choosing them. I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming myself, right? But it's kind of like you're grabbing whatever you can just to get some income, and then you're surprised you can't last more than a year. Whoa, well, how about that, right? The thing is, though, is that I discovered that by establishing a set of goals. And give in the future to work towards those goals, everything will eventually pan out. But I mean, it, it just took that that kick in the ass, so to speak, to get things moving. Like when you do get fired, like your friend there, to use that as an opportunity to make a change in your life. Absolutely. There's, pl there's plenty of people right now that can probably need to hear this message because because of what's going on right now with those coronavirus stuff. Is that people people have lost out. In, in terms of in terms of their job, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're 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 dead and buried. I mean, there's so much more that they can possibly do to live their life to their full potential, which is what entrepreneurship is all about. If you do 100%. it right, yeah. You know, you talk about as a kid. I was the same way as a kid. I was very uh, energetic to the point where I don't drink coffee these days. Because if I drink coffee, I feel like I'm on like some sort of upper. Like it's it's crazy. So like I just I was very energetic and I was. I was entrepreneurial minded as a kid and school isn't structured for the most part. 99.9% .9 of schools aren't structured for people like me where, you know, I wanted, I was a creator. I was a big thinker. I was a doer as well. Like I put the work in as well, but like, it's just schools where you have to stay inside the lines and you're painted into a corner and, you know, things are changing. You know, there's Seth, Seth Godin school, alt business MBA, and there's different things that are out there where they're, they're seeing a change and a need for people to really, operate differently than just the classic model. So I think that's starting to change. And I think in the next couple of decades, we'll see a big shift, which we're already seeing now. Um, and there was a piece that you said too, which entrepreneurs, you know, you have to be able to jump out of an airplane as an entrepreneur and figure out without a parachute, figure out how to build that parachute before you land. So there is some of that um, leap before you look mentality. Obviously you want to do it as smart as possible, but you have to have a little bit of that risk taking mitigated risk to be able to get to where you want to be. And I think that if the biggest thing I, I could say for an entrepreneur or an emerging entrepreneur is number one, how do you want to make your money? Like, what do you want to do? And if it's serving people, if it's selling widgets, if it's, you know, whatever the deal is creating something and, and you know, whatever, but then it's also making money too, which is, you know, it's important. So to me, how you make your money is more important, but making money is like right there. And so you have to be able to validate your idea. You have to be able to solve a problem, but how you do those things and how you sleep at night is more important. Yeah. You know what though, Jesse, I think it also requires having an uncompromising belief in yourself. Yeah. Right. And th this is probably the, the toughest part because I think that, and, and you, you talked about this earlier too, I think in the green room in, in terms of educating and studying and reading books and, and really, uh, really absorbing as much information as you can, uh, 
but even by talking to guests on the podcast, for instance, that is one way to do it. Yep. And, and I think that that's, that's another skill or a process that many people have, have just forgotten. You know, I, I guess I, many people stop reading books after they're done college, you know, because I think back then it was all like, you will read this book right here. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it, it's, it's some terrible, yeah, it's, it's like punishment, right? So after you're done, you're like, screw this. I'm never reading another book ever again. Yep. And, and what, 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 what I didn't realize is that I was doing a disservice to myself and my education. I mean, once I, once I, once I woke up, and started really exploring books and, and really applying that knowledge, my life has been totally different now. Insane. Totally different. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, like for me, um, I've recently got it, gotten back into reading actual books, but for the longest time, I've been an audiobook guy. I've been a podcast guy, YouTube university, Google, like I find my information that I need. And, and I would say that, you know, um, the, net, the, the conversation piece where, you're talking about someone needs to really double down on themselves and have that confidence. They also need to have a support structure. And that's where that network of, you know, there's this rule of thirds that I talk about, and it's not anything I made up. I've heard it somewhere along the way, but basically there's the third of your contact should be above of where you are. You're at like the Patrick Tuckers of the world, the people that can show you how to get to the promised land that have your best interest at heart. The next third of people should be in the middle with people that you're rubbing shoulders with. You're going through the trenches with together. You can share wins and losses, best practices and help each other. And then there's that third of people that are just below where you're at that you can turn around and coach as well. And having that support system and structure, and I'm sure you know this as an entrepreneur, you know, even though I'm, I'm in a people-based business and I'm all about clients, it gets lonely sometimes. And it, there's times where it's super dark and like you're dealing with some stuff and you're wearing multiple hats and doing different things that you need that support structure to lean on. So that's what I would say is on top of doubling down on yourself, Surround yourself with a cast of superheroes that can help you, you know, stay in the game. That's funny. That call it's, it's called the rule of thirty-three. That's what I call it. I was just telling someone the other day about that. <laughs> Did you really the same thing? <laughs> Beautiful. Rule man. of thirds, rule of thirty-three. That's what I call it. It's, 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 it's making its way around the earth. That's great. Right, right, right. But it's true though. It's true. And then, then you know what though? It's funny because when I was in corporate and I, I, I wanted to get out, you know, and but not enough that I was actually willing to like leave a six figure job. Right. But what I did was I decided to go for the upper 33%. Right. And I started messaging people. I started messaging. This is a challenge I, I'll often put out there. And if, if listeners check this out, this is, this could be great if you do this. If you reach out to one person every day on LinkedIn, just one, that's it. Just do one, a person that could possibly change your life. If you get, if so, and you, you take them out for lunch, on, uh, you pay for it. Don't be afraid to spend money on this, right? <laughs> you pay for it. Uh, buy them a drink, buy them a coffee, go, go get an adult beverage after, after work or whatever, right? Buy them appetizers, pay, feed them, and just try to strike a friendship with them. And you know, I did that. I did this, I did this challenge for a month. And out of that, I met two people. And these two guys are the ones that, that helped change my life to this very day. It's those two guys. One yeah. of them I don't talk to anymore. The second one, though, he's, he's still a very good friend. We're connected on LinkedIn all the time. He's, he's just like you said, he's actually 20 years ahead of where I am right now. It's, it, it's, it's exactly what I needed. That challenge will change your life. I think, but you know what, Jesse? I think the hardest part is that many people, many people are afraid of rejection, yeah. Maybe they're, I, I don't know what the problem is. I think for me though, it took getting kicked out of that company before I now was forced to, to take action. Yep. It didn't have to be that way. I, I wasted a year. I wasted 12 months of my life. And if I would have known what I know now, I would never have wasted that time. I well, should have just left. Where, yeah, exactly. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? And it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if I'll ever say that again, because two months before 2020, I put out this beautiful video about this is the first time 2020 is in front of us. It's going to be a great year. And so I, <laughs> I think I think I'm the reason for 2020. So <laughs> I, caused, I jinxed us. But, you know, in terms of, um, you know, mentors and, 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 you know, doubling down on yourself and, and, and reaching out to people you know, you have to surround yourself with people that care about you and that can help you grow. And, and, and that's what makes life a little bit more interesting as well Is like you have people to do life with. And, and the thing about people that are afraid of rejection, what the base level fear is, is they're afraid of not being liked. And, and, you know, hundreds of years ago, if you weren't liked, you were kicked out of the tribe or killed. Right. And so it's a, it's a survival mechanism to want to be liked and to want to be a part of a group. Even if you're a rebel like me, you don't really give a shit. And like, you kind of anti-establishment, which is weird because I'm in like a financial planning business, but like, that's how I operate. 
there's, there is, you know, my whole pitch to clients is you want to do business with people that you like, know, and trust. Like that's like, that's the baseline of a relationship is like, know, and trust. And once you can get past the fear of rejection, which the, you know, fear is false evidence appearing real or face everything and rise, those couple things. Once you can get past the fear and you just reach out to people, you realize they're people too. And you realize that they may or may not be in a capacity where they could take on a relationship. But if they are, like you did, you found two amazing people in 30 days, which if you think about that, the power of compounding interest, if you did that every month for a whole year and you found 24 amazing people, like who knows what could have happened, right? So double down on you, give a shit less about what people think because people are thinking the same thing. That's, that's the weird thing too. The, the, the most successful people in the world, they have the same worries, but sometimes they're just a little bit different when it comes to the value of those worries. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what though, Jesse, I think part of it is, is getting in front of those people and have them, I mean, it rubs, success rubs off on, on, on you, For right? Sure. You hang around with successful people, it rubs off on you. But I, I seem to think though, too, that the, the entrepreneur that I am today, the, the deals that I'm doing, I mean, some of them are very, very scary. I don't know that I would have done them, <laughs> you know, five years ago. I mean, as an example, so, so I think I mentioned to you earlier, we bought the Rockefeller building in downtown Cleveland, right? This is an iconic asset. It's uh, we paid $13.3 million for this asset. Right. But at one point the deal was in jeopardy, right? We're, we're going to, we're going to lose the whole thing. Now we're going to wow. lose the asset and lose all the money that we put up. We had about, we had about a million, uh, $1.2 million that was the root of lost on this thing. Right. And uh, you know, it was, it, it, I had to basically put on another quarter million dollars just to hang on to the deal and then go raise the money to finance it because we didn't even have the financing for us. This is all during COVID, right? Right. The, the, the funny thing is though, I mean, it was tough. It was hard. It was very, very hard, a high degree of uncertainty. And I mean, it, but in my mind, because I, I, I'd, I'd been a tough entrepreneur all the way through, that was, this is obviously not my first deal. I knew I'd pull it off somehow. And it was scary, but you know what though? I'll tell you, I mean, there was a time when I was scared, man, but I would, I, I would rather take my worst day in real estate over my best day working for some company that I would never want to be at. Can't Bar say it any better. That's the, I mean, like episode over, that's it. <laughs> that's like, how could you, like, you can't top that. I mean, that's, that's beautiful brother. And so what do you, what did you, because you said five years before this, you probably wouldn't have been able to, um, maybe pull it off or see it through what changed in those five years? Was it mentality? Was it, you know, your skill set obviously increased, but like, what do you think was the five year differential that helped you make it happen? Yeah, it was definitely the skill set, right? It was definitely the teams that I surrounded myself with. Uh, it's definitely the knowledge that I acquired. Uh, we have a book list, right? So that, that same phone number that I, that I mentioned earlier, if someone texts that number, they actually get out, they also get the book list that I, that I call it the book list that'll change your life, right? You have to read or listen to these books uh, one a week, which is a lot for a lot of people, right? And I was do, I did that whole book list and once a week, right? I was listening to a new book, very, very hard muscle to flex, right? Very tough. But if you're able to do that consistently and put new knowledge in your brain, it, 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 that, that opens up your mind tremendously. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's kind of like getting yourself in the right team, getting the right information, uh, and, and really developing a callus around, uh, around your emotional state. You know, it's kind of like if you do CrossFit or you work out and you're doing heavy weights, you start getting calluses on, on your, on your palms, right. From doing all those heavy weights, right. It's kind of like that, except this is over the fear that you experience and, and fear only shows up because you don't have the, the knowledge, the knowledge, the lack of knowledge is where fear comes from. That's why we get fearful, right? That's why if you're walking, that's why. Okay. So back again, the voice of 10,000 generations is always whispering in our ear, right? And if you're going into a dark area, our, 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 our heightened senses take over and we get really scared. We start looking around our eyes open and we get a little bit freaked out. Right. Yep. Why don't people do that when they get home? <laughs> they're, comfortable. <laughs> they're, open to, yeah. they're comfortable, right? It's like, they're not worried. 
why is that? Because they're safe. At least they think they're safe, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> hopefully they're safe. Yeah. Right, hopefully they're safe. But that, but that's the reason, right? And and it's kind of like you have to develop a callus around that fear, yeah. right? That that's what it is, and uh, and that's what that's what I did. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, and no, and, and I'm not saying that everybody should be going off and doing these types of deals. It was a very tough deal with a very tough circumstance. But uh, uh, now I'm not even afraid to do big deals anymore. I'm trying to find bigger deals, actually. Now you're bulletproof so. in a sense. Yes, you'll have your up and down days and your uncertainties just because it's a human mind works. But because you've seen that pay off and your, your ability to stay in the game and achieve, you know, sky's the limit. Now it's like, what's next? You know, what's the yeah. new thing? And so I think it's beautiful, man. It just the, the human spirit and dominable way to win these in tune, built in senses of fight or flight, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. You talk about callousing your, your, you know, ability to be able to get to where you want to be callousing your mind. And we talked about David Goggins before we jumped on was, um, a big thing for me over the last two years when I found his book, uh, can't hurt me. And we have a similar background. I was bullied growing up. He was bullied growing up. And like, we went through some tough life circumstances and then, you know, the military kind of saved our lives and we've been able to do things after that. And, you know, he talks about doing uncomfortable shit because you're training your mind and you're callousing your mind like, like a muscle, like you're getting stronger. And one of the things for me, I've gotten into all this like biohacking and human optimization stuff through the years because I've always been around it, but this, it's been really something I've paid attention to, but things like taking a cold shower every morning for me, um, you know, we talked about it. I'm not a coffee guy. That's my coffee. And it does so much for my mindset outside of just the physical benefits, reducing inflammation, helping my cells at a mitochondrial level, like, you know, repair and grow and do different things. Like there's a lot of like nerd science in there, but the biggest thing for me is when I don't want to do it, that's when I do it. And I, and I turn that sucker on just barely. So it's on and it's cold. And no matter I'm in Georgia and I'm from Boston. So I've completely climatized, which is funny, but like even on the coldest setting in the summer in Georgia, it's pretty cold. And so now that it's, it's approaching winter here, it's, uh, it's, it's waking me up a little bit quicker. So all I could say is the callousing of your mind, Doing uncomfortable things because the safety of your mind will pull you back and it'll take you away from the greatness. And if you push yourself little by little every day and incrementally more and more and more and more little weird things. Like I remember I was even, I would carry in the big jugs of water, like the 40 gallon jugs of water and I'm right-handed dominant. But I was like, let me just hold it with my left hand. And it hurt a little bit and it, it was straining and like just little things like that that you can do throughout the course of the day leads to the big things, being able to close $113 million deals. Yep, that's right. And I think it also trains your mind too, right? It trains your mind. It's, it's physical, but also trains your mind to like hold on that one minute longer. For sure. Or do something yeah. you don't want to do because it's 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 almost like a game, but it's 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 just a way to be tough. And and you know, there's we've it was like uh tough times make for good men and soft times make for not good men kind of thing. And we're going through this period that we need as and this is women too, not just men, but we're going through this period that we need right now as a human society where we're facing some tough times because times were really good for a long, a long period of time. We went through a bull run in the stock market of over 12 years. Real estate's been really high. I mean, you know, we've been living off the fat of the land. And unfortunately, it's taking a pandemic and some global disasters and some crazy stuff going on in the world to really kind of recalibrate us. But we're going to see some beautiful things come from this pandemic. We're going to see great art that's coming out with people that have been locked in their houses for months, like artists and doing different things. We're going to see businesses lean up and get meaner. We're going to see people that come out and have more inspirational stories to tell. And it's just, you got to really take advantage of the now and you got to really make sure that you're living for the now, but planning for tomorrow. You know what, Jesse, I would even venture to say that the next, I'd say 10 years are going to be the best times to to really take advantage of what is coming, you know. So to your point, we've had a, we have a, a strong bull run. We had a recession, however, however you want to call it, but it's technically a recession. We did yeah. hit recession levels. <clears throat> that means the next 10 years, if the cycle is true, there are about 10 years should be a freaking boom. And yep. this is when people, if you if you do have an inkling to be an entrepreneur, you need to take that action now to take advantage of it because you don't know if you're getting another chance at this. You know, it's, 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 it's what I did. You know, if I missed 2000 after 2008. I missed that boom right afterwards, yep. you know, yep. but I'm not Be missing prepared. it this time. And taking advantage of it. You're, you're giving me chills right now. I wish I could show you, but just being able to, you know, uh, success in hard work or, or is it success and opportunity or hard work and opportunity was kind of where the road converges to success. And it's, it's, it's right now. And it's always right now. We're in the big now. Like if you think about it, we only live 
in the now. Like we've experienced the past, the future is hopefully in front of us, but it's always now. So don't wait until January 1st to get on your health and fitness goals. Don't wait to January 1st because you want to start a business. Like do it now and like do it smart. Maybe you do it on the side and from six o'clock to 10 o'clock at night, if you can afford to do it, you're building a side hustle, side business, like whatever it takes, but you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And at the end of the day, if there's one thing I could say to people, it's just do what you need to do today so that you can live life well and not have any regrets. That's right. That's right. That's right. Excellent. So someone's listening right now. Okay. And, and they're, maybe they're all jazzed up. They're all like, they're, they're ready to roll. What sort of bulletproof advice would you give them? Ah, oh, just get started. Just start today. Like it's the whole narrative, man. It's like, you know, the days that I don't want to train and, and do like my training protocols from running martial arts, like working out, like none of that stuff. It, like the days that I show up to the gym, quote unquote, are the best days like that I don't want to go. So if I don't want to go and I just show up and I just start, there's, there's a notch in your mindset that's it's activated and it's toughened. And so just get started. And it's basic and it's, it's simple, but it's not easy because the mind starts making up all these excuses and you're like, well, I'm tired or I have to go do this or I don't want to do this. Like whatever the, it's just all noise. So if you can learn to shut that voice off or say F you to the voice, just get started. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think part of it is, is to do that, you have to start acquiring new data, new information, because I think when, when you realize that we, we are, we have, we are living a stream of consciousness and we are, it's an overlay to a primate, to an animal, basically. And this animal will tell you whatever you need to hear to get you to sit down, grab a, grab some, grab some, uh, some, grab a cookie and some ice cream and sit down and relax. Yeah. That's what, that's what a human animal will tell you. And this is where the stream of consciousness needs to take control and drive that human animal to do great things. So that's one thing that this, this, this machine, these machines that we live in today that we call our bodies can do wonderful things for ourselves and it can help a lot of people. But the only way you can get there is if you take that massive, massive action. It's the only way. It's, the only it's, way. it's just that incremental step forward every day, not being afraid to fail, getting back up, having a support system in place to be able to help you bridge the gaps and, and just keep moving forward. You know, big uh, Rocky Balboa fan and he's notorious for his memes. And one of his memes is just keep moving forward. Like yep. is, life's going to hit you harder than you can ever expect, but get up and keep moving forward. And that's how life is. Life's never going to be perfect. You're never going to have it all figured out. Just enjoy the ride and keep moving forward. That's right. That's right. All right, guys. Well, if you want to reach out to Jesse, you reach him via his website at 46and2wealthpartners.com. Hope you got some inspiration to get on your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I know I did, and I'm glad, I'm glad that I'm here. <laughs> I know I did the right thing. Likewise, brother. Uh, so uh, thanks for tuning in, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. 